Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's Festival of Teaching event uh, here at Augustana. It is a, uh, indeed a pleasure uh, to welcome Dr. Gary Macklis here to Augustana. Gary is science advisor to the uh, director of the United States National Park Service. Uh, he's also a professor of environmental sustainability at Clemson University. Janet tells me the reason I am introducing Gary today is because I may be the only one who knows where Clemson is. <laughs> it's in South Carolina. Dr. Macklis also serves as co-leader of the U.S. Department of the Interior's Strategic Sciences Group, which conducts scientific assessments during major environmental crises. Uh, he previously served as Professor of Conservation and Interim Associate Vice President for Research at the University of Idaho, and he's been a visiting professor at Nanjing Technical College in China and at Yale University. Gary received his bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Washington in Seattle, his PhD in human ecology from Yale University. He's written numerous books and scientific papers on issues of conservation and sustainability, including the State of the World's Parks in 1985, the first systematic study of threats to protected areas around the world. His most recent book, Warfare Ecology, A New Synthesis for Peace and Security, was published in 2011. At the University of Idaho, Dr. Macklis taught courses in sustainability and conservation, human ecology, and environmental science policy. He has received numerous outstanding teaching awards at the departmental and college level, as well as the uh, Burlington Northern Award and the University Teaching Excellence Award, the University of Idaho's highest recognition for teaching. Uh, that's important to know as background since Gary is going to be talking to us today about teaching. He has engaged students in innovative service learning courses, various field courses uh, here and abroad, uh, and also advanced independent learning. Uh, in 2010, Gary was elected as a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, one of the highest honors in the United States for a scientist and a particularly rare honor for an interdisciplinary scholar. Gary's topic today is the craft of teaching local sustainability. Gary, it's a pleasure to welcome you to Augustana. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me join you. Um, I, when I, the invitation came to come to Alberta, from South Carolina, I said, oh great, February. <laughs> and, but then I also was so attracted to come to Augustana for all kinds of reasons. I, I, I was really impressed and excited and enthused about the description of your mission as educating whole persons. And I found that to be attractive. One of the pieces of my background is that I was a professor at Southern University, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, a historical black college and university. And in the United States, the historical black colleges, their care for their students, the focus on the undergraduate experience, the passion with which they do that kind of work, um, I just found compelling. So when the opportunity came, to come and talk with you about teaching and focus on local sustainability, I was not going to resist. And then you provided a beautiful day to drive out here, <laughs> you know, a nice lunch that eventually I'll get to eat, and um, I'm just very grateful for the opportunity. What I'd like to do is talk with you a while about the craft of teaching sustainability, and then by all means answer questions, etc. I do have some things here. That is a loaf of white bread, a jar of Nutella, a spoon, toilet paper, a roll, a knife, deodorant, water from the Fiji Islands, white bread, and a good book. And my goal would be to bring these together somehow. Um, the craft of teaching sustainability. One of the things 
that taught me about that craft is an extraordinary experience. So I want to begin with a story. That's the story of the Sardinian knife. I went to Sardinia in 2003, and one of my goals was to travel to the small village of Patata that's famous for its knives. And I went to order one of these knives. I walked into a little shop. There's all the little shops in Patata, and I went to the one that accepted MasterCard. Americans do that kind of stuff. And so I showed up, and I, and I ordered, and they had the different opportunities. And so I ordered, for example, a knife that had a particular blade made of local Sardinian steel. Um, and the handle has a ram, it's made of ram's horn. So I ordered all of this, and the fellow said, well, it's going to cost $120 US. I thought that was a modest price for a beautiful piece of and he said, you pay $60 now, and then I'll write to you and tell you when it's almost done, and you pay the other 60 and I ship it to you. I said, fine, it's great. We go through the transaction. And as I'm walking out the door, I, I forgot to ask him, I said, and oh, by the way, how long will it take before I get the knife? And he smiled and he said, two years. <laughs> okay, and I walked out thinking, whoa, I didn't see that coming, but that'll be fun. I'll wait two years. I waited a year, two years, the, the receipts beginning to dust up and decay on my bulletin board, and I get a letter from Patata in a town, so I have to go get it translated, and finally I find out his family, his father's been ill, Ram's horn is hard to find on the hills outside of Patata. They're getting there, but it'll be another two years. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, what can I do? And I'm thinking, maybe this is a scam, I don't know. But that was just my cynical self. The receipt on the bulletin board is getting as aged as I am. We're talking about four years now. And pretty soon, four years goes by, and there's no knife. There's still no knife. And one day another letter comes in Italian. And I take it translated and it says, your knife's almost done. Send us the other $60. And I'm excited, I send them the $60. And then nothing happens. 2006 bleeds into 2007. One day, a package from Italy arrives. And I open it up, and it's my Sardinian knife. And what's amazing about it is I still can't think of anything a North American can buy for $120 that you'll wait four and a half years for. <laughs> and that taught me about the importance of craftsmanship. Craftsmanship takes time. By the way, if any of you can think of something that only costs $120 that people will wait four and a half years for, please tell me. It's a riddle that I have not solved. Yes, Alan? I did my PhD research in Sardinia. I have half a dozen Sardinia <laughs> And you didn't have to wait four and a half. <laughs> right. Well, but to me it became mythic. It became true. <laughs> So I want to first talk about craft and craftsmanship because the knife taught me to start to think about teaching as craft and craftsmanship. There's the Sardinian knife maker, certainly craft goes into these knives. But there's other ways to express craftsmanship. You can do it building surfboards in California. You can do it the Libyan street worker making these beautiful shoes in Libya. That's craftsmanship. And then, of course, back to Italy is the House of Beretta, which has made fine armaments for half a millennium, 500 years. This is the Beretta S.O. Sparvieri, a shotgun. <coughs> the engraving on this shotgun takes 600 hours. It takes 600 hours, and it's done by master craftsmen like Ferdinando Borelli, who's been in, his family's been doing it for four generations. Craftsmanship can also be like Ruth Ware. 
a Torres Island, Torres Strait Islander in Australia, the ability to make her fabric. And then one of my favorites, one of my favorites, Duff Goldman, who has his own reality show with the most wonderful name, all about cake making. He's called the Ace of Cakes. <laughs> That's craftsmanship. And so I believe this whole idea of craftsmanship, unhurriedness, <coughs> practice, quality, and a care for the act of doing, a compassion and care for the act of doing, can be applied to the craft of teaching as well. To the craft of teaching as well. This is John Spire at Plymouth University in England teaching a class in Portugal. And I consider him a craftsman in his capacity to teach well. Now, there's a book here that I would highly recommend to you to consider. It's by Ken Bain. It's relatively recent. And it's called What the Best College Teachers Do. And he asks four critical questions. He asks, what do the best teachers know and understand? How do they prepare to teach? What do they do when they teach? And how do they treat their students? And the answers to that, I think, have great importance to both the craft of teaching and more particularly the craft of teaching sustainability and particularly the craft of teaching sustainability local. One of the things he argues is to know your subject, know it really well, and be able to teach it via compelling stories. Via compelling stories. A story like perhaps Paris in 2003. A heat wave so severe, it was the hottest temperatures on record since 1540. Over 14,000 deaths as the temperature rose above 40 degrees Celsius for over a week with no night cooling in a city without air conditioning that lived off nighttime cooling. 14,000 deaths centered around Paris, centered on the heat wave. Paris heat wave is a way to teach what? It's a portal, the compelling story of the heat wave is a portal to teach about climate change about adaptability, about architecture, about history, about human health, about community resilience. All those things can be taught through the portal of a compelling story like the Paris heat wave. It can also be done by a revelatory image. Look at this. There are more people in, living inside this circle than outside of it. A simple map that is a portal again to tell the compelling story and teach about sustainability, issues of equality, global history, population. Another compare, I love this comparison. Um, and this is a photograph of a family of four in the United States in 1951 when I was born. Don't do the math. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and it's all the food they ate. It's all the food they ate. Think what a fun class assignment it would be to have one of your Augustana students recreate this for Alberta in 2014. What would it look like? First, it may not always be a man and a woman heading the household by themselves, right? But second, imagine the different kinds of food, the different level of processing, and what you could teach about household life, about local production, about food, about health, all from one photograph. And the best teachers can also use powerful examples. Nutella. Nutella was first invented in about 1946, again in Italy. So, so far I've talked about Sardinian knives, shotguns, and now Nutella. It, they finally got the formula right in 1964. A mix of palm oil, 20% of it, hazelnuts, because they had too many hazelnuts and they had to figure out something to do with it, 
There's about 50 to 75 hazelnuts in a jar of this stuff. And sugar, lots of sugar. In fact, one scoop of Nutella, Nutella is worth 200 calories. Do I have a volunteer? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> 200 calories. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It's being oh. led to temptation. <laughs> Nutella, Nutella, excuse me. Um, Nutella, can it let us teach about ecology? agriculture, production, environmental impacts, the palm oil, <laughs> the, the residue of palm oil, um, the um, husk can teach about waste management, and the production process, yes, that's a picture of Nutella being extruded in the factory. In fact, all the Nutella eaten in North America is made in Brantford, Ontario. <laughs> all of it, right? And so Nutella, is an example of how good teachers can choose a simple object or a compelling story that reveals all kinds of connections. Global and local. In fact, good teachers not only are able to do that in contemporary times, they're able to tell the history of ideas. You care deeply about local sustainability. So this, it, this particular piece I want to share with you, particularly for Augustine, and that's to understand the history of ideas. You've heard of this, think globally, act locally, right? But where did it really come from? There's many who claim, David Brower claims it, environment. A Canadian, Frank Feathers, says he did it. But if you study hard enough and you dig and attempt to find it out, the phrase came from a French Marxist, Guy Dubois, the president of Situationist International, who led the Paris uprising in 1968. And it had nothing to do with the environment at the time. It was an argument for political action. Think globally, act locally. And good teachers are able to share the history of ideas because they empower students understanding where it comes from, understanding where the ideas come from. Good teachers, I believe, also make the invisible visible. The invisible visible. This is a chart that should disturb all of us. This is a distribution of slaves and slavery in 2013. 27 million men, women, and children are enslaved right now. Right now. And that includes, for example, sex slavery, exploitation of workers, a whole range of enslavement, child slavery. How do you teach that and not make it abstract? One way, one way, is again the compelling story of the individual, an individual sex slave in Asia, and what that life is like. And I believe that we cannot focus on sustainability and do a good job if all we talk about is the visible. And making the invisible visible is part of our responsibility, particularly for students that think they're far away from this, but it is connected I meant to put a slide in and I did not have time, I apologize. It's a slide that shows the recipe for the manufacture of cocaine. And it shows how much kerosene is used, as a, how much toilet paper is a filtrate. The Drug Enforcement Agency of the United States traces toilet paper in Colombia because it leads them to the um, cocaine manufacturing. And anybody who thinks that's not local, the upstream water quality in Colombia is directly related to the cocaine trade in the United States or Canada. And making that link between local and global is, I believe, an important act of making the invisible visible. 
And there's lots of different ways to teach as a craft these things that Bain described. It can be small group discussions. It can be pro student projects at community college here building rockets to learn how to make, learn about physics. It can be the field trip. It can be, and this is important, at all different scales. The idea that only small classes work or only large giant lectures are profitable for an institution, neither of those make sense in terms of effective <laughs> teaching. Effective teaching can be one-on-one. -on -one. It can be in small groups. It can be in larger discussion groups. It can be in small lecture halls. It can be in medium lecture halls. And this one, Professor Sandell of Harvard, that's a big lecture hall. By the way, his work is, it, oh, it didn't come up. Is very, there, that's a big lecture hall. Um, he teaches government and his work is very controversial because his MOOC classes and his streamed classes are so popular, they're driving students out of other institutions from taking government courses. So the controversy associated with effectiveness is part of what we have to figure out. I really believe what Bain describes. He says, I can't, it's his words, I cannot stress enough the simple yet powerful notion that the key to understanding the best teaching can be found not in particular practices or rules, but in the attitudes of the teachers, their faith in their students' abilities to achieve, and their willingness to take students seriously. Isn't that part of the common good that is part of Augustana's mission, all three of those things? And isn't working locally one of the advantages to be able to do all that? That attitude, that willingness, that faith? So Bain's argument is critical to us. But the issue of sustainability pushes us further to ask, well, what do we teach? Because remember, you have to know the topic, too. So you have to have subject. Well, then what is it that you teach about sustainability? What to teach? And I would suggest it's made complicated by our ambivalent relationship with nature. I love this picture for all that it tells about our flexibility, our resilience, and outright craziness of homo sapiens. That's a good picture. But it's made more difficult, but I believe there are core competencies that undergraduate students should know about, should know about to learn and practice sustainability in their careers and in their lives, and as citizens. One of those core competencies is to understand nine basic Earth system processes. They come from the World Watch Institute's State of the World. And these nine are so critical that they should be part of basic education for say, sustainability for undergraduates. And they should know something about nitrogen and phosphorus cycles. They should know something about fresh water use, as these two young girls in Pakistan illustrate. They should know something about land use change, both, both agricultural and urban and local. This is a view from Hudson Bay's tower. That's Edmonton in about 1940. I couldn't get the date on the postcard, 1940 to 1950, somewhere in there. Um, Edmonton. And then, of course, there's the oil sands to the north and all that that can teach as a portal. There are experiments students can know. To learn about ocean acidification, show them an experiment, a student experiment, on a nautilus immersed in acidified ocean water at levels seen today, and how the shell of the nautilus degrades over 45 days. It can be taught by understanding pollution and its impact. They should know something about aerosol loading, the small act, and the large impact that it can have. They should certainly know something about biodiversity loss, and in the large scale, the impact on amphibians, mammals, birds, and what is happening to coral around the world. But also to take the abstract and make it specific, such as the South China Tiger. The Clemson football team is called the Clemson Tigers. Now, before you think that has nothing to do here, I must 
applaud my new university's approach to athletics. For the athletic department and the football team is so successful, they bring in immense sums of boosters and donors' money, more than they can handle, and we have made an arrangement with them with Tiger Conservation International that if you really love your Clemson Tigers, help save the real ones in the wild. It's extraordinarily lucrative for conservation to do it. Now, I, is Augustana part of Alberta's athletic program or do you have your own team? We have our own. And they're called the? Vikings. Vikings. That's harder. <laughs> That's right up there with the University of Santa Cruz, California. I don't know how they'd be able to use this technique. They're called the Santa Cruz Sea Slugs. <laughs> we would have to have our students know something basic about climate change, the hockey stick, but also bring local. This is the Lillian Glacier in Olympic National Park in 1905 to 2010. I work for the National Park Service and we have a dilemma that sometime around 2030 we'll have a park that we could name the park formerly known as Glacier because there won't be any glaciers in Glacier National Park. That's bringing it locally because it's to let un students understand the world your children will experience will be different, will be different. And again, it can be taught in different ways, but those core competencies are not just a list of scientific processes, but also some other things, like the linkage between animal health and human health. How things fit together is part of understanding sustainability. And if you think that's not a significant intellectual breakthrough, ask Bill Gates, who asked an astounding question. Why do we have vet schools separate from medical schools? Since around the world, where there are unhealthy animals, there are unhealthy people. And healthy people depend on healthy animals. Why is the vet school here and the medical school here? And at Washington State University in Eastern Washington, they were brought together, one health program, with significant amount of money from the Gates family to reconfigure and rethink what veterinary medicine and animal health is all about. Students would understand the individual, making the individual matter as also the larger scale. This is the Abu Shuk refugee camp in Darfur in 2007. There's over a million people that have gone through this refugee camp. And I believe students need to learn at all those scales. They need to also learn about social change, how social change occurs. And so the social sciences matter deeply in undergraduate sustainability training. It can be in these formal sets of how products are adopted and diffused all the time, but we have to be careful to not just teach inside the system, but have students understand outside. And my favorite is the street artist Meek from Australia. I love his, photo, his argument, keep your coins, I want change. <laughs> I want change. In addition, we need to teach our students for turbulence. And this is a phrase written by, uh, made up by a guy named Mariates. And I think it's really insightful because a young, think of an undergraduate who shows up at Augustana next year, a freshman. Their whole lives, if they decide to be an environmental professional, their whole careers will be consumed by climate change. Their whole lives, their whole career, climate change will be continually impacting what they do. Every new park ranger we bring in to the U.S. National Park System, their whole career will be about climate change and mitigation and adaptation and research and education. And so we have to teach for turbulence. And again, following Bain, it can be done through compelling stories. The story, for example, of the roller coaster ride at Seaside Heights, New Jersey that was washed into sea by Hurricane Sandy. You can teach physics, 
You can teach natural hazards, you can teach engineering, you can teach resilience, and you can teach culture because this place mattered to the people of New Jersey. As I mentioned yesterday in Edmonton, many marriages began on the roller coaster at Seaside Heights. Just ask Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> we also have to teach the harder side of ecology and environment. This is a map of the drug cartels in Mexico. Now what has that got to do? All of this has had such an impact. It has altered American immigration policy. It has altered the Caribbean because as these drug cartels begin to fight with one another, the drugs move to the east and up through the Caribbean and up through the eastern side of the United States into the eastern side of Canada. We share this problem together. So understanding the cartels is a way to learn about local sustainability. And then we come to the social history of white bread. <laughs> it's a wonderful book by Aaron Bobro String. And it tells the history of white bread. Because in the 1880s in North America, particularly in the United States in the eastern urban cities, local homemade bread was seen as unsanitary. It was seen as unhealthy. Dirt, it was it, it had the flour wasn't well um, taken care of, the nutrition varied dramatically, and there was a large racist element to the rejection of homemade bread and local artisan bread because it was mostly done by the immigrants who had come into the cities like New York and Chicago, Cleveland, and there was great resentment of their presence. So production loaves were invented. Each slice, the same shape. Each slice with good nutrition. Each slice safe for your family and good for their diet. And this became, if you wanted to care for your family and have them have good health, they would have white bread. They would have white bread. Would you like some white bread? <laughs> sure. Good. Good for you. Good for you. What's I find the social history of white bread, and if you'd like some Nutella, <laughs> there, there we go. All that's missing is those little chrome ball sprinkles, you know, yeah. you know, like ball bearings. But the key is now this is seen as well. That's not healthy. Local artisan food is healthy. But notice the arguments that make you go and want to go buy organic bread at an artisanal place and a special grocery store are exactly the same arguments that were made for white bread. For white bread. Understanding the social history of products is a portal to students to learn about sustainability. In my undergraduate courses, my favorite project, and this is always dangerous, just because it was fun for me isn't that it would that it wouldn't be fun for you or your students, is the students would form teams and they'd have to pick a thing, stuff, cement, glass, cotton, beer, uh, they'd pick it. And then they had to figure out where it all came from. And the student groups that could get up and say, we really understand cement. <laughs> it, it was fascinating to see them, under, see how everything was connected and to understand, wow, I never knew how blue jeans were made. Or a favorite, of course, was beer. And so <laughs> each team would figure out well, where the hops came from, et cetera. And it was a wonderful exercise. And then all the posters on the walls would fascinate the administration. They would, they would say, oh, cement, beer, plastic, prophylactics. They'd go through the, the whole thing and they'd say, clearly this is Gary's class. And then they'd walk <laughs> on. They'd walk on. And so the compelling stories, whether it's white bread or the compelling story of consumption. If you want to teach about turbulence in North America, consumption of stuff is definitely part of that turbulence. And that takes us, of course, to Walmart. There are 14,000 Walmarts. Actually, the number is 
14,177 Walmarts in the, in the world, and 382 of them are in Canada, and is there one yeah. here? Aha, so one of the 382 are here, right? And Walmart has such an impact, half of the American adult population visits a Walmart every week. Walmart is so tied into the American economy that when Congress, and remember I worked for the Obama administration, when Congress foolishly cut food stamps for the poor, Walmart's profits are projected to fall because that's where the poor shop. That's where the poor shop. And Walmart's supply chain is so large and so big that when it makes a, a decision, it ripples not just through their stores, but through all consumption. Some of you may be as old as me and remember when deodorant came in boxes. Right? You opened the little box, pulled out the deodorant. What did you do with the box? Tossed it or recycled the box. The box was only there to hold the deodorant. Well, it was Walmart that said, we're tired of paying for all the cardboard in the box. We're tired of paying for all the fuel to move the cardboard. And we're tired of using all the storage facility for the cardboard. All we want is the deodorant. And the deodorant's already in its own package. Just give us the deodorant, skip the packaging, or we won't buy it from you. Try buying a deodorant that comes in a package now. When you go to the store, it's all just like this. And all that extra packaging is gone because of Walmart's supply chain control. And that brings up tubeless toilet paper. Tubeless toilet paper. The tube in toilet paper, of course, was included so that in the machinery of making the toilet paper, by the way, in 1896 is when the tube was included in toilet paper. If someone can write a history of white bread, <laughs> it's only a matter of time before a graduate student does a thesis, all right? And the tube was there to spin it faster, to be able to make this stuff faster. But think of it, when you use toilet paper, what do you do with the tube? You either toss it, your children make an octopus of it, you know, or something. Or I've been told, I have no knowledge of it, that it can be used to improvise a bomb. I don't know that. But it's wasteful, right? So Walmart made a deal with Kimberly Clark to invent tube-free toilet paper because you didn't need it technologically anymore. How much would be saved? They did all the comparison calculations. And again, to try to bring it local, if North Americans bought tube-free toilet paper, it would save, in terms of the waste stream alone, the equivalent of all the garbage of Red Deer every year, just getting rid of the tube. And that doesn't include energy costs. It doesn't include fueling or space heating for all the storage units, et cetera. So understanding Walmart, and I'm not suggesting Walmart does perfectly on everything, not at all. But understanding Walmart because of its reach is part of a compelling story of sustainability. And their impact, both positive and negative, is part of that story that needs to be told to students about sustainability. Here's a favorite one. This is probably the least inviting recycling center in America. It's in Fort Collins, Colorado. Notice the first thing you read is no. Just no. You know? <laughs> then, it, then it says, it says please flatten the boxes, but it's in italics with an underline that says flatten them. You know, and they're saying please, but really they're saying no. And then there are these machines or tanks or whatever those things are. And they're of course the irony it's a recycling center. And there's not a tree, not a flower, not a blade of grass. It's just an industrial plant that says no. I believe our, in terms of community service learning, our undergraduates can always do better on these kinds of things. There's a craftsman who once said, if 
It didn't work, but I failed better. <laughs> and classes can be like that, community service. I once did a community service course on recycling. The students, the undergraduates, they studied recycling, they did surveys of local people, they came up with a plan of how a, um, recycling could be introduced into this community that didn't have it. They organized, they had a plan. I scheduled a meeting with the city council where they could present their ideas to the city council. The young men and women dressed up. It's 15 minutes before the city council meeting and I'm in the bathroom with 10, 12 young men trying to teach them how to tie a tie. You know, and, and it's, all right, gentlemen, the <coughs> rabbit goes around the hole. In the <laughs> and the best part of it is how miserably it failed. The city council treated the students with no respect. They ignored their presentation. One of them fell asleep. The students were horrified to see the messiness of democracy. And they were discouraged beyond all belief that the city council paid them no heed. Now, I could have just said, OK, we lost. But failing better, I said, well, they didn't listen to what you had to say. Do you believe in what you have to say? And the kids said, yes. I said, well, OK, then let's go to the state legislature and see what happens. And they said, we can. That was the moment when they began to be empowered, right? So sometimes in service learning in classes, failing is a great move, is a great move. You fail forward, you fail forward. So in all of this, in all of this kind of teaching, I have hope in the future. I mean, we are a strange species. This is water in F in from Fiji. It's water from Fiji. You've had white bread. You might want some. <laughs> <laughs> so you get, you get the sip of, of Fiji water. Why it's here in Alberta, I don't know, right? And what's fascinating is instead of a kind of contempt for those who buy it, there's a fascination. What makes us buy that stuff? What fascination is there? And what does it mean for sustainability. So we are crazy. The same impulse that creates that water, you can drink it. It's safe, I think. No, I know it's safe. OK. Look, I love this picture. <laughs> like, look at the optimism of Homo sapiens to do that. We can do this if we have enough Fiji water, right? But look at this. There's an optimism there, too, a resilience there, too a life force there too. And both of those matter. We are like a craftsman, the teachers. We can be like craftsmen. And in doing so, if we become really good at it, we gain a burden in terms of our impact on students that is not to be denied. It is the burden that we are like Faust. We can, through our teaching, make a world much better, like the Jordan River between Jordan and Israel, co-managed by two countries, the Jordan River of the Bible, right? Or we can create a Dante-like hell on earth. The choice is really ours. But I remain hopeful after all this, I remain hopeful because we are the species that invented music. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone? If you take four scoops, you've got equivalent of the diet of much of the world in terms of caloric intake for a year. I mean, for, for a day. No one wants that. Is there a student here? <laughs> are you the, are, is there any other student here? He didn't like bread. Can I, can I choose the Nutella over the <laughs> <laughs> White bread? 
<laughs> and you get the new towel. <laughs> How about the toilet paper? The toilet paper, <laughs> the toilet paper stays with me. <laughs> Thank you. Enjoy it long. Thank you. <laughs> Are there questions or comments? Hmm? Yes. I belong to a student group on campus who strongly advocates for environmental consciousness and recognition of these issues, and I find my greatest challenge is getting emotionally involved in, involved in the issues, and so I'm just wondering if there's an effective way to communicate these issues to an audience that's maybe not on board, but in a convincing way so that they don't get caught up in the, oh, she's just a tree hugger who we can right. ignore. And, and so you said that you have a trouble with the emotional thing, unable to care, is that what it is? What's that? No, unable care to care? Too care too much. Care too much, mm -hmm. okay, care too much. One of the ways to do that is to make sure that you make comparisons and link to everyone's real life, to real life. Let me give you the hardest example. I showed an image of white slavery, okay? I showed an image of white slavery. How do you teach white slavery to students without abstracting it or turning it into fear? And how do you teach it with respect for the victims at the same time? You don't exploit them, right? Well, one of the ways is to always link it to students' lives. So if I was teaching a class of young persons like yourself, and I was trying to explain the horrors of white slavery, I wouldn't just start going. I would ask a student like yourself, your name is? Kirsten. Kirsten, I would say, Kirsten, how old are you? I'm 22. You're 22. And then I would attempt to tell the story of a 22-year-old woman in white slavery and what that meant for her, her life, her family, her community, the world, the exploiters as well as the victims. But notice, the whole time I'm talking, it's linking to them. So part of the way to diffuse that emotional wall that you create because you care so much is to always be able to communicate it in terms that are relevant to them, not relevant to you. It's not why it's important to you, it's why should it be important to them. Here's another, um, it's either a party trick or a dare, I'm not sure what to call it, but in my classes, at any time a student can stop me cold, interrupt, in the middle of a sentence, with two words, only two words, and no, not those bad words, okay? <laughs> they can say, so what? And the minute they say, so what, I can finish what I'm talking about, but then I have to somehow explain the applied reason. So what? Why should we care? And if I can't, I can say, I can't do it right now. I'm going to go learn. I'll do it next time. That's what I would do, is make sure you're not talking about what's important to you. But here's why it could be important to you, why it matters to you in your life, and link it as close as you can to their real condition. Someone else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, uh, at first we were talking, you know, I, I don't remember the base, I, I forget the base. Or oh, maybe it's just the way that uh, you introduced and said that uh, use a story. Use a story and then you can link every single thing after that. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering about the danger, and maybe it's not a dangerous how you do it, if that you do this and then the, sto the story is so good that a student remembers the stories and nothing beside it. Right. You know, like, it, and it's not that, but again, it's, I was thinking about my question, and maybe it's not that bad because they don't have to remember what you want them to remember. Maybe you can remember something else. You are a wise teacher. You are a wise teacher. Because that's the core of what Bain talks about. You're empowering them to learn, you're not filling their head. In calculus, that kind of teaching is called plug and chug. And you plug the kids in, you chug it down, and it's plug and chug, right? So the very idea that what matters is what they bring out of it, not what you try to push into it, that's part of the whole wisdom of what Bain's talking about on effective teaching. And from my point of view, if they go, oh man, I remember this story, what was it all about? They've asked the right question. They've asked the right question. So I would not shirk from using 
compelling stories to tell the broader picture. So maybe the question is, how do you make sure that you go and think, oh, what was it all about? Instead of just, hey, I heard the story, and you tell the story, and then how do you go to make them? You always, the have, you always have to link the story to the so what. You don't just tell the story. Like, for example, if all I did, can I have my Nutella back? <laughs> <laughs> it's your Nutella, but can I borrow it? You, no, you can Borrow it. So if all I did is tell the story of Nutella, Nutella, right, and just end it there, then it's just a joke. It's just a fun little lounge act kind of thing, right? But if I link it to agricultural production, if I link it to nutrition, if I link it to, it, to the global economy, now it's starting to be a story for a purpose. So I, I, I use sloppy language if you think I meant tell stories. It's tell stories as a keyhole to get to the broader ideas. No, I understood that. I'm just wondering how to now to make sure that my student asked a question. Because I you think You can't make sure. It is their lives. It is their intellect. All you can do is create the condition where the students feel empowered to ask the questions and you're willing to listen. But you can't. It's their brains, their heads. Someone else. Yes, sir. Gary, issues like climate change easily lead to despair. How do you teach for a sense of hope? First, I actually talk about hope. I say it's okay to have you know, I mean, There's some crazy hope, but there's also really good hope. And I know you think I'm joking, but I'm not. Just look at that picture of Elvis. How can you not look at that joyfulness and how cool he is at that stage, right? <laughs> and not have hope for human existence? So the arts, everything we do in the arts, the Russians call it art is bread. Art is bread. So one way to deal with hope is to link the humanities and the arts. That's why I teach Faust, not just the biophysical processes. The other is to channel that despair into collective action. To say, if, if, if I despair that we can't stop the glaciers from receive it. Well, then what are you going to do about it? Well, I'm going to educate people. I'm find the smaller thing that you can do. So you channel the despair and you use the despair. But one of the great fears that I have is that you could teach a course, like I, I teach right now an environmental policy course, part-time. And the other part, I work in the Obama administration in Washington, D.C. I could come back and give them enough horror stories about the political process they'd all run screaming from civics. But if you don't do that, if you try to keep it balanced, then the despair can be channeled. One story, and this is really a powerful one that shows how you can reconceptualize things in new ways. I worked in Haiti after the earthquake, and I met at rebuilding science capacity in, in Haiti. And I met a teacher, his name was Guy Etienne. Guy Etienne. And Guy was a high school science teacher. And two years before the earthquake, he taught his students to build a seismograph from scratch. Then he taught them how to calibrate it. Then he taught them how to monitor it. Then he taught them first response, and to do that he had to teach the human body. And then he taught them emergency response and community resilience. He did all of this stuff, and he was away in Port-au-Prince when the earthquake that the Haitians call Guru Guru, because that's what the earth sounded like it moved, Guru Guru. He, taught, he ran back to the school, and all his students were alive, and they were out in the community helping others, all of them. And I said to Guy, I can't believe it. That's the most amazing science class I've ever heard. That's the most amazing science class I ever heard. And he looked at me with that kind of benign pity that a Haitian, an education, educated Haitian can have for an ignorant US citizen trying to help. I, I didn't know what I was talking about. He says, Gary, it wasn't a high school science class. It was a civics class. And that was like a lightning bolt to me. Science is <laughs> civics. And the idea that you teach science in the science class, and health in the health class, and history in the history class, all exploded when he said, oh, Gary, it's science, you know what? Civics class. 
that's how you deal with the disparity. Is you bring the hope from other disciplines always to bear. Always to bear. He was, he, he's an amazing teacher. And I don't know, this is just popping to mind. If you ever do want to bring a speaker that will just smoke everybody, bring this guillotine, how he can teach high school in Port-au-Prince and how he links things. Truly an extraordinary educator, an amazing man. Anyway, someone else. Yes, sir. Um, I was intrigued by your comment about you know, failure can be a great move. Certainly we've learned a lot from that. Sometimes we try to hide our failures. Um, uh, for example, we, many of us use uh, community service learning as well, and we have a saying uh, that there's no such thing as a bad placement. You can learn so much about yourself and the community. Or, uh, we have this wonderful $50,000 composter outside that has not worked. And so we're trying to wrestle with what to do about it. <laughs> or, uh, you know, when we're building new buildings, we had to compromise about can we make it the most state-of-the-art, mm -hmm. energy-efficient thing. So we have this story that we tell our donors and the story that we tell our uh, students about coming to this place with no imperfections, but we, there's the reality of, mm -hmm. of doing sustainability that has problems and failures along the way. Um, <coughs> How can we be honest about ourselves with the structure, the institution, trying to balance right. the actor? Well, remember, I'm a guest here. I cannot <laughs> yeah. specifically to Augustine, right? But I showed you that picture of Faust, and there's something important in that picture about the question, right? Because the story of Faust and the Faustian bargain, which many of you know related to environment, we think it was came from Marlowe the English, right? Where he said, you sold your soul to the devil for 24 years of power, and then the devil came to take his soul. And Marlowe had his Faust say, I'll burn my books. Don't take my soul. I'll give up my knowledge. I'll burn my books. <laughs> but the Faustian bargain I'm talking about is Goethe's. And Goethe was a piece of work. Goethe switched it, and the bargain was a deal between God and the devil, where God bet the devil the devil could never satisfy Faust, the other man. Because God said, it is human nature to strive, err, and strive again, and you'll never get him to be satisfied. The devil takes on the deal. The devil helps Faust seduce the virgin peasant girl. It's a great story for undergraduates because it's got sex and real estate speculation in the first 20 <laughs> pages. So, you know, they'll get it. And he does all, he invents money and credit. He does all these things. He does forestry. There's a whole scene in part two of the play where Faust is leading all these foresters and they're doing selective cutting. He finally says, I think if this gets done, the end of the cut, I'll be satisfied. The devil swoops in to get his soul. God breaks the deal on a technicality. Remember, he said, I think I'll be satisfied. And Faust's soul starts to rise. The devil goes in for his soul. God sends the cherubs to seduce the devil's bad guys. This is Goethe writing. And at the very end of the play, he rises up, his spirit rises up, and who does he meet? The, quote, eternal feminine, represented by Marguerite, the virgin peasant girl he seduced in part one of the book. Because, God says to a ticked off devil who believes he's been tricked by God, he says, humans strive, err, and strive again. That's adaptive management. And that's the real Faustian bargain. So I actually believe the best way to do that kind of communication is we strive, we err, we strive again. The best metaphor is the airline industry. Every horrific crash is a learning experience. Why did this crash occur, and how can we make it safer? Every crash. 
The opposite of that, strive, <coughs> arrogance, strive again, is the arrogance of, for example, oil companies wanting to do Arctic oil exploration who say, don't worry. Whenever an oil company says, don't worry, then start worrying. Don't worry. We have a safety culture. It'll all be okay. Because, of course, a true safety culture, like the airline industry, is always worried about it. They're always checking things, and you're ready to fly, and they say, we're sorry, a red light has gone on that shows the bathroom does not have soap dispenser, and we're not flying. Right? So I believe the strive, err, and strive again that comes from Faust, the true Faustian bargain, is an honest way to teach. We try these things, we err, but then what's most critical is not that the composter isn't working, is that students are doing a research project trying to figure out why not and how to make it work or what would be better. That the second part, the second striving after you err, that's the story. That's the story. Someone else. See, we've gone all the way from tubeless toilet paper to Germanic <laughs> literature. <laughs> Someone else? Yes, sir. Well, clearly it's time for American politics. Okay. Um, um, my buddy here uh, was talking, was it only yesterday, about Michelle Bachman, um, who was referencing the fact, uh, anyway, something about how English, if English was good enough for Jesus, it must be good enough for other people. And her point was, and she did have one, uh, it was sort of educational despair. Yes. In, 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 um, so, I mean, it's one thing, I mean, I guess it's what I'm trying to, the point I'm going to make is, it's one thing to use our skills and our ability to um, empower an undergraduate class. But sometimes, I'm thinking here, not of American politics, but of Albertan politics, because I can slag off Albertan politics quite easily. Um, sometimes the broader context brings both you and your class into despair because now that you've learned these things, you know, there's some pretty significant uh, and powerful contexts which are very difficult to, mm -hmm. to dislodge. And I am well aware, I'm not, not all north and south of the border folk don't understand what's happening in Alberta and how it's a complex question. It's not, there's not a simple answer. <laughs> and to teach students, we've got the answer, I know the answer, this is what you should believe, is a disservice to them. Because teaching for turbulence, whatever scientific knowledge you have about oil sands development now is not going to be what the knowledge is 10 years from now. We'll know more. And we can't say for sure which way we'll know more. And so. I believe that you empower students by learning all different points of view, but the key then is to say, if, they're, if the despair starts to climb up, we're well, where else has this happened and what has been the trajectory? You can teach about Albertan oil development by looking at Texas, and you can teach about Texas by looking at Malaysia, and you can teach about Malaysia by looking at China and Venezuela and Brazil. And sometimes backing off and teaching by analog from another place, the insights pop in their own heads and, they get, and the despair disappears. Not every story of oil development ends poorly. And so I'm not, I don't want to be, I don't have a position. I'm trying to learn both sides and all sides, both is too simple. But I do believe that when you're dealing with a controversial issue, one legitimate alternative is to introduce students to how it's played out elsewhere and let them put the pieces together of what that means for their local home, for their local home. Every community thinks they're unique. In the Park Service, we call it Alaska exceptionalism because every Alaska park says, oh, we're not, you know, we're different than all the other parks. So those rules, those are just for the parks on other parts. We don't, we don't have to follow those rules. That exceptionalism, the idea that if each case study is perfectly unique, then how can you advance knowledge if each one is perfectly unique? The real trick is what's distinctive about it and what's not. 
So the hard question to ask an undergraduate in Alberta is, what's different about Albertan oil development from Texas or Malaysia? Then you're getting somewhere. Someone else? Hmm? Um, yes? Let me follow up from Jeremy's question then. So last semester I taught philosophy, philosophy of the environment and technology. I teach that nearly every year. And um, I have had a lot of students there who are from northern Alberta who their families, their, their families' uh, economic well-being is, is tied to oil sands development. And I also had a number of students who belong to First Nations communities also um, in the same, um, same area. So the problem I had there was not um, despair amongst the students, but this uneasy realization of how implicated they and we and our campus, the province, the entire country are in oil sands development. On the one hand, we say no, we, do. Um, we see what's wrong with this, how this is uh, how this is harming us. But at the same time, well, I'm still driving between Edmonton and Camrose, for example. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how do we deal with? Yeah, because it's actually, I think, it's a, a recognition, and this is what I wanted them to get to an understanding of how they're implicated in it but I didn't want to leave them in a place of um, paralysis. What, there's a few techniques that I'd recommend to try, to experiment with, to strive, err, and strive again. One of the most important ones is to have, it's John Rawls' philosophy of the veil of ignorance. To have students take the veil of ignorance, and if you don't know lots about it, don't worry, most of us don't. Um, and that is, assume that you don't know what your position is on the, you don't know whether you're rich or poor. A decision has to be made on whether to expand food stamp support for families. But you don't know whether you are a mother of four children who need those food stamps, or you're a rich person who doesn't need them at all. You don't know. You are behind the veil of ignorance. Now how do you decide? when you can't decide on self-interest. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's helpful to give students the veil of ignorance and say, how would this development impact you if you didn't know where your position was? I, I taught for 30 years sandwiched between the Coeur d'Alene and the Nez Perce tribes. And we had many students, indigenous students. And once they had to transcend their tribal affinity, all kinds of new learning went on. You had to bring them back because of their care for what. But the idea that tribal students could only learn through tribal knowledge, I saw that as a kind of myopic contempt for their intellect. And so it, the veil of ignorance was one key tool. The other was what I just described. Let's learn about development somewhere else. And then you tell me how it might apply. You tell me how it might apply. You could have six speakers come here to Augustana talking about oil sands development in Alberta, and all you'd have is a lot of controversy and air moving, right? But if you brought a speaker, two, two or three speakers, who talked about the history of development in Texas, all of a sudden you've got enough emotional distance, as you described, and enough room for the controversy that all the, it, all the connections afterwards, all you have to do is say, what has this got to do with us? And you can make progress. I think, I, I think um, First Nations teaching is fascinating. Um, at Idaho, um, the whole idea, I don't know how it works in Augustana, but, but at Idaho, the Coeur d'Alene and the Nez Perce, their graduation rates were like, Great, but it took eight years instead of four because they had to go back home. They just couldn't do it for long periods of time. They had to earn money. They had to help their family and all that. And we had to battle with our administrators. We had to battle with our administrators that all those rules about how fast you get students out, once you make that choice, you have made a choice against First Nations learning in contemporary higher ed once you made that choice. <laughs> so we had to show that there were value judgments buried in academic education policy before we could get anywhere. Before we could get anywhere. Someone else? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. 
Uh, where do you get your stories? How much of it is by your traveling and personally experiencing it? How much is through reading or just being aware of things? Um, in Idaho, a horse that goes the wrong direction is called a maverick. Okay, so I admit flat out, my reading patterns are maverick. And I'm not recommending that they should be done by everyone. Hand, the choice between reading a journal in my particular discipline and poetry in a country that I'm going to go visit, no challenge, I go to poetry. So it is read broadly and make connections, right? And always respect what the humanities can teach you. Always respect what they can teach you as portals to understand. And when there's compelling stories, write them down. Write them down, where's my journal? It's filled with stories, just little snippets that then I figure out later, one of my goals is to teach a class the ecology of stuff. And that would be the name, the ecology of stuff. And the books would be, the only books that would be assigned would be a long bibliography of books that had to have a one word title, cotton, salt, plastic, tea. And we just learned, and every student could pick some stuff Say, I'm going to I'm going to use tea to learn about ecology, and the other person I'm going to use salt to learn about ecology. So part of it is picking up from the broader thing, and then what's really powerful is the the disciplinary knowledge you have gets filtered through the story. It is if all you have is the story, it's not enough. But if you have the discipline and you push that through the story, now you've got a combination that I believe can be compelling. And then when you're on an airplane, read like a fiend, you know? <laughs> My favorite trick is you put the headphones on. And then you have the line snake down, but you just have it go in your pocket. You're not really listening to anything. But the person sitting next to you won't talk to you. <laughs> but you're missing a chance on the story. <laughs> That's a good, good point. <laughs> That's right. Good point. <laughs> That's a good point. I'm reading a book about stories, and the person next to me might have the better story, right? That's true. I like that. Next, next flight, I'm when I'm doing it, I'm going to say, I remember what you told me, and then I'm going to have to turn to this really strange looking person next to me and go, got any good stories? Before I plug in? Before I plug in. We'll let you bring Melanie back to yes. South Carolina. There. But you've got to send her back. That's right. That's right. Do we have time for one or two more? Or is now a good time to stop? Last chance? Yes, Naomi. Oh, I was just going to ask you, there's a TED Talk, and it's called The Danger of the Single Story. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, um, I'm trying to remember, I've seen it so long ago, but it's an African woman talking about how people had the story of poor African people, and so when she settled in a, a white culture, there were all these assumptions made about her all the time and she was so tired of that single story. Um, so I liked that question where that person asked, how do you counterbalance the stories with the facts? Um, and so I'm wondering, do you like to use some novels or some s stories too of just what has happened to a land base or what has happened to a culture of people or um, where it's not just the story of the individual, but it's a a story of the place or a mm -hmm. story of the resource and how it's been degraded over time. And, and I, I would strongly agree with you. The sense of place and stories of landscape are important. The one concern that, and you raise an important point, it goes back to indigenous students and indigenous knowledge, is I always run screaming when people say they or we, as if it's some monolithic whole. The Nez Perce, I cannot speak again for First Nations here, but the Nez Perce, anytime someone would say, the Nez Perce believe, I'd roll my eyes. Because the Nez Perce, it actually were the tribal elders, the elected tribal council, the on-reservation Nez Perce, and the off-reservation Nez Perce. And they all didn't get along, and they all had different views of every issue. So when you'd say the Nez Perce believe, you knew whoever was talking didn't know what the Nez Perce believed. I cannot say that that works here, but I would say that we run a real risk when we simplify, as you described, Native American First Nation knowledge, and we call it something general like indigenous knowledge, 
right? As a, as a kind of bin to put it all in. That would be like saying science as opposed to the different disciplines. And so I think a good story and a sense of place comes from, well, what other characters are there? Too often, like, yeah, and, I, and my daughter is a literary, literature professor. And when we have arguments on pedagogy, um, I'm going, how can you teach this novel and focus on this character? The minor characters are actually the fun part of the story. They're the ones that enrich it. So the, I guess what I would advise is if you've got a novel that really teaches sense of place, have the students read it and then have them focus on the minor characters and see what happens. And I think they'll get a very different view. Uh, by the way, I lose all those arguments. For those of you who have daughters who are professors of literature, don't do it. It's just, <laughs> you'll never win, you'll never win. Um, you've been most gracious, and it's been really fun. And, 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 and I just want to compliment you from the heart. What you do and the impact of your students and the distinctive nature of Augustana, it's really something precious, so don't mess it up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.